Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm Trent Fowler, and tonight I'm bringing you a solo episode. Uh, but my co-host Thomas and I are futurists, keynote speakers, and consultants with decades of experience in analyzing trends and communicating new developments to audiences across the world. Reach out to us at futuratipodcast.com slash contact dash futurati if you'd like to hire us for consulting, to speak at your event, or to advertise on our podcast. I just wrapped up an interview that I have been wanting to do for a very long time, and it was with uh, Dr. Terrence Keeley. Uh, Dr. Keeley is a biochemist by training, but his claim to fame is the publication of a book called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, wherein he explodes this really widespread myth that the only way to get basic research into physics or into genetics or whatever, uh, the only way to, to move that forward is with government funding. It's only with government dollars that anybody would be incentivized to do this kind of research. And so the advancement of the frontiers of human knowledge requires a reliance on the state. And he says, that's not true. I can prove it's not true. And then he does prove it in this excellent book. And he's got another one forthcoming that he calls Economic Revolutions. So I've been wanting to do this since I learned about his book. I finally got around to reading it in April of this year, right before I moved. And due to some scheduling difficulties, we didn't get around to actually recording it until just now. But it, it lived up to my expectations and exceeded them in many ways. And it was just a fascinating conversation, very, very relevant in a world where we're thinking about quantum computing, we're thinking about the frontiers of material science, we're thinking about artificial general intelligence, and we're casting about for ways to fund these and ways to move them forward. So his work is as relevant as it's ever been, and he is just a, a delightful person. He's uh, a consummate British gentleman. He's got uh, really, really great manners. He's got uh, He's very warm and very fun to talk to, and he has a, a, an incredible command of the material. He remembers when things were published and who was writing them and what the incentives they faced were and what the economic consequences were. He knows all of this off the top of his head. So it was a fantastic conversation. Couldn't be more timely. And I really hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So with with no further ado, this is my interview with uh, Dr. Terrence Keeley. Tonight, we're joined by Terrence Keeley. Terence is a professor of clinical biochemistry at the University of Buckingham in the United Kingdom, where he served as vice chancellor until 2014. As a clinical biochemist, Keeley studied human experimental dermatology, and while doing that research, he learned how distorting government money could be to the scientific enterprise. In 1996, he published his first book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, in which he argued that, contrary to conventional wisdom, government need not fund science. His second book, Sex, Science, and Profits, argues that science is not a public good, but rather is organized in invisible colleges, thereby making government funding irrelevant. If you enjoy this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Dr. Keeley, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Trent. Of course. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Well, I was a very conventional and respectable clinical biochemist uh, until in 1995, um, the University of Oxford, having offered Mrs. Thatcher, who was then the British Prime Minister, an honorary degree, then withdrew it from her very public humiliation of our Prime Minister on the grounds that she was single-handedly destroying British science because she was cutting back funding, British government funding for science. And I was very happy to believe that was the case except it manifestly wasn't. I was then working in two different labs for complicated reasons in Oxford and in Newcastle, and both labs were struggling with the problem of having too many scientists and too many grants and not building extensions fast enough. So there was this huge discrepancy between what I was being told by all my academic colleagues, that Mr. Thatcher's science class was destroying British science, and what I was actually witnessing was that British science growing at an uncomfortable rate. And when I went into this and investigated, I found, to my surprise, because I'm not a trained economist, I'm a biochemist, I found the phenomenon crowding out. And what had happened was that Mrs. Thatcher had indeed cut back, quite modestly as it turned out, uh, government funding for academic science in Britain. But the private sector had compensated by putting in three times as much money as she had pulled out. 
And what the what the academics were saying was only reporting half the story. They were reporting correctly that Mrs. Thatcher had cut funding, but they had simply not reported. And I, to this day, I don't know whether the scene is or didn't want to see it, this huge influx of private funding. And that made me think that the government funding for science was a very interesting area. And so I added it to my portfolio of things that I studied. And what I found very quickly, I should just carry on for a minute, Trent, just to get into the case. What I found, and to my complete surprise, because until this point, I was an utterly conventional scholar, was that there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever, none, that governments need to fund science, either pure science or basic science, or on the other hand, research and development, if it's economic growth you're looking for. And the classic example, the most famous example, is that of the United States of America, where you are. The United States of America had a policy of laissez-faire in science as late as 1940. So by 1890, America had become the richest country in the world. 50 years later in 1940, it was still the richest country in the world. In fact, more than still, it had become the dominant industrial power in a policy of governments not funding science. A complete contrast to the situation in France and Germany, where governments funded science very generously, but they never even caught up with America and that's led over to it. And then in 1940, because of the war, of course, and then afterwards in 1957, because of Sputnik, the American government poured fortunes into the funding of both pure science and research development, increasing its funding something like a hundredfold. And the implications and consequences and effects on rates of economic growth in America were precisely zero. And then when latterly the American government pulled out, and what we don't realize is the American government now funds very little research and development, and actually um, a surprisingly modest amount of basic science. Yes, about 45% of basic science is now funded by the American government. It was once 75%, but the impact has been absolutely zero, the economic impact. And so I concluded simply as a biochemist looking at the empirical data, I'll talk about the economic argument shortly, looking at the empirical data, there was simply no evidence that the government funding science either in America, it's the same story in Britain, by the way, or in France or in Germany, made any difference whatsoever to economic growth. And that, I think, is a very interesting story. Yeah, that's that's fascinating because I think there is a really strong intuition throughout society that there's just no returns on basic research. And so an entrepreneur like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk simply wouldn't be building particle accelerators or funding research into string theory or, or cosmological models of the birth of the universe, because there would be no point in doing so. Um, I, I have several follow-up questions that I want to get into, but you mentioned that up until, I believe you said the 1940s, the American government had a very laissez-faire attitude towards the funding of science and basically didn't do any, and that that really began to turn around during Sputnik. So I, I have two follow-up questions on that. First, I mean, do, do you think there is ever a situation which, in which it's appropriate for the government to step in and, and fill what could be viewed as a, a gap in the funding of a core technology, especially when we're facing down an existential enemy like the Soviet Union? Uh, you know, we, we could tell ourselves a story about how the Rockefellers of the time would have come in and, and funded the space program. But the fact is, we were facing this huge threat. They were ahead of us in the space race. There were vast implications for our future as a nation and plausible. I think a person could be forgiven for believing that that's a situation in which the government should step in to fund that because it has to be done so quickly. Yes, well, not just quickly. I mean, there is definitely a role for government. What, what people don't understand is there are two completely separate models for the government funding sites. There's what you call the National Science Foundation model, which is where the government gives money to the National Science Foundation, to the scientists of the National Foundation. And simply says to them, fund whatever research you think appropriate according to peer review, and we'll hope that something wonderful comes out of it. But then there's a completely different model, which is the DARPA model, or the ARPA model, which came in in 1958. Because what happened in 1958 is that after the launch of Sputnik, the federal government in Washington said the National Science Foundation model has failed. The Russians have beaten us to space. So we now need a completely different model which is not driven by the scientists and not driven by pure science, but is driven rather like the Manhattan Project, was driven by a general, by someone who's not a scientist, but who has a mission, in this case, launch a rocket to the moon. And as if, if that mission includes in part 
employing scientists, then so be it. But it's not driven by science, it's driven by the purpose of the mission. And there is no question that a democratic government has every right and indeed every duty to fund darker type research. So if a government says, we believe that the cigarette companies are damaging the health of our people, we need to go and prove it, you then bring in some people and say, go and prove or disprove that cigarettes are good or bad for smokers. That is a DARPA model. You have a social function and you fund science as part of it. That works. In fact, it's not just works, it's a logistical function of government. But when people think of the national or the government funded for science, what they're generally thinking of is the National Science Foundation model, which is a linear model, so called. But the government funds basic science, which, as you apply, would be applied otherwise. I'll actually address that when we come to it, which wouldn't be funded otherwise. And that without basic science, there would be no economic growth, ultimately, because industry feeds off basic science. That is the model that fails, and it fails totally. It has never been proved to be right. It has constantly been proved to be wrong, but it remains embedded in the popular psyche, and we can talk about why that should be. So there are these two morals. Yes, governments should fund DARPA, ARPA for social purposes, mission science, they call it. And that goes all the way back to the origins of the foundation of the Republic. Even back in the 18th century, the Republic, the United States of America, was funding mission research, such as, for example, the Marine Hospital. But the foundation of pure science was say, say, the schools of economic growth that comes only after the war has never been proved to deliver economic growth and actually made damage. Hello, this is Trent Fowler, co-host of the Futurati podcast. One of the most common pieces of marketing advice I've come across is to know your audience and give them what they want. One difficulty in podcasting is that it's actually pretty hard to do this. None of the major platforms give us any way to reach out to you, our listeners, to find out what you enjoy about the Futurati podcast and what you'd like to see done differently. So we've decided to record this commercial and ask you directly to reach out to us. Head over to futuratipodcast.com, go to the contact page, and drop us a line. Tell us about your favorite and least favorite episodes, what you'd like to see us cover in the future, and anything else you want us to know. We produce this show for you, and we want your advice so we can make it even better. Thank you. Okay, so so as I understand it, there are two models by which the public sector can fund science. The first, as you described it, is the mission model, and that's where you have an enemy, or you're you're doing weapons research, or you're doing uh, foundational research into some area that's of social uh, concern or social benefit. That's it, that is legitimate. But this idea that there would be no string theorists if we didn't have a state keeping them employed, that's nonsense, and also not necessary for economic growth. You've got it in what? Okay, so I, that, that redounds somewhat to my follow-up question, because I was going to say, well, what about the internet, which you know grew out of an ARPA project? What about uh, all, all the knock-on effects from what we discovered as a part of the space race? I think you would say that's mission science. Your claim is not that that can't positively impact GDP. Those things can and do positively impact GDP. That's, that's your understanding. Yeah, although when you look at what you just described, the internet, you look at the billions upon billions of dollars the federal government invested in those programs, it would have been extraordinary if something didn't come out of it. And yes, something did come out of it. The real question is, would it have actually happened more quickly and certainly more cheaply without the government? And the classic example of that, of course, is what happened in Silicon Valley. The very interesting story here that's now completely forgotten but after the Vietnam War, as it was coming to an end, the Defense Department in America commissioned a, a program of research to ask how much of all the money that had been spent on defense research, basic science and defense research, how much that benefited the Americans in Vietnam, to be blunt. And they identified 700 research events that the Defense Department had used since the Second World War, of which only two came out of the government funding pure, pure science, i.e. it had been a complete waste of money. And so what happened was that Senator Mansfield, this is really interesting, Senator Mansfield, um, who then headed up Senate, blew his down um, DARPA, or rather, to be precise, he closed down the pure science that DARPA, in a sort of mission creep, started to fund, and he sacked all the pure scientists that DARPA were then funding. And where did they go? They went to Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, they invented all the wonderful technologies that we made, the smartphone and all the rest of it. It's a very well-known story. What is not well-known is that 
when Steve Jobs and Bill Gates went to uh, the science park there, Ad Xerox Park it was called, and saw all these wonderful technologies that Xerox had developed, only because it was now employing dark scientists who had been sacked. All that had come about only because they'd been sacked by the government. And so the question, therefore, is if the government hadn't deployed them in the first place, would they not have been deployed anyway by the private sector? And you can show very clearly this phenomenon crowding out. And let me tell you how it works. Every time the government funds a scientist, they take that scientist from the market into, to use a cliche, an ivory tower. And the trouble with that is that commercial development comes from scientists in the market. And the trouble with taking the best scientists out of the marketplace, and of course the best scientists both work for the government because they're more freely, is that even copying, even copying other people's advanced technology requires first class scientists. So if you take all the best scientists out of industry and put them in the ivory towers, like happened before service at Mansfield, threw them out of the ivory towers, what happens is all the best scientists do their own stuff and they do very good science. But there's no one left in industry of the caliber to import that knowledge and turn something useful out of it. And so the evidence of crowding out is that when that happens, the private sector says, well, there's no point investing in R&D. We have not conscious scientists we need. We'll invest in marketing or something else. And so the government taking all the best scientists into the ivory towers actually reduces the economic value of science in the private sector. So crowding out is a real phenomenon. Yes, to come back to your earlier point, if you put billions or even trillions of dollars into a research program, of course you're going to get something. But you might have got an awful lot more if you'd never had that research program. And those scientists had never been removed from the private sector, which is the sector that did this growth. I, I, I made a similar point uh, recently when I was arguing with a friend of mine on Twitter over the economic benefits of the space program and government-funded scientists. And I said something like, you know, if the government stopped employing chemists, they wouldn't go into the parking lot and kill themselves. They would find other things to do. Like they'd, they'd find somewhere to go to do some research, which might be different from what they were doing before, but you know, they would find some way to employ those skills somewhere. And we presumably would get a lot of chemistry out of that. Uh, I, I want to- let, uh, let me just interrupt. You have a perfect example of that in Senator Mansfield closing the pure science faculties at DARPA and those people all going to Xerox Park and actually turning their theoretical skills into the technology that made America the technological giant it currently is. America's always been technological giant, but the current technological gigantism comes from the closure of the pure science of DARPA. Sorry, I interrupted. No, 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 that's that's a remarkable thesis. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to spend a little bit more time on the two models because I think that will bleed over into discussion of the Baconian linear model and uh, the Smithian model. But you know, first I wanted to, to ask just a... Uh, ancillary follow-up question. So presumably with mission-driven science, that could involve basic research, basic research into physics for weapon systems, things like that. So what is it that characterizes, in your view, the, the essential difference between those two models? Is it just that with mission-driven science, you actually do have a mission? There's a thing you're trying to accomplish, and you therefore have a standard to judge good results or good and bad progress or, or what have you. Whereas when you're just throwing money at string theorists and saying, see what you can come up with, there's no way to evaluate that. There, there's even in principle, no way to get to a finished product that someone will pay for in the marketplace. It, it, it doesn't impose the same discipline. Is, is that right? Or am I missing yes, an important that's part? A, that's a very important part. There is a, a one-word expression came out of an Arizona State University research. It was come back to me in a second. By Daniel Sarovitz. And Sarovitz, who does believe in the government funding of science, but he believes only in the dark model, not the NSF model. He very famously said, it's technology that keeps science honest. Science at the moment, as you know, has got a crisis, a reproducibility crisis, which I think is much worse than actually has come out, and it's pretty bad even to start to come out. And the, the reproducibility crisis is because under peer review, the whole thing is just a closed circle. So if you want to get a, a grant, you've got to make sure that what you write appeals to the peer reviewers. And so you, you, you will channel your research to appeal to them, and you keep out the stuff that if published, might oppose their views. If you want to get a paper accepted, you've got to appeal to the editors. And so you end up with a self-referring cycle in which the entire community, nutrition is a classic example. You know, the 30 years we've been told that fat is so bad for us, we know it's carbohydrate, which will smash them outside this magic circle of scientists. If you want to know, if you want a, 
uh, a community that is not just inwardly referring all the time. It's got to be tested against technology. So Saravid said it's technology that keeps science honest and it's peer review that makes science dishonest and the reproducibility crisis also shows that. That is part of the story. But the other part of the story is that, of course, if you're interested in trying to make a technological goal like going to the moon, you need pure science. And what is often forgotten is how much pure science is already funded uh, by mission science, not just in government, but in industry. Something like 35% of American pure science today is funded in industry. Something like 25% of pure science in America today is funded by the foundations of the universities out for their own funds. And the government was already funding at less than 50%. And the point is, if you want to go to the moon, you often have to do pure science. If Unilever or uh, Jeff Bezos wants to make a new technology, you often have to fund pure science. Even Thomas Edison discovered the thermoionic effects. Pure, lovely piece of pure science, because he wanted to develop Mars. You can't distinguish between pure science and applied science. It's actually a continuum, except if you're lobbying for the government funding a science, and then you come up with a false model, which is that sort of supply side push that you could push technology by doing pure science in isolation. That's simply not true. Pure science, as a literal part of applied science, is very healthy, and it will be funded by the mission researchers, whether it's government or research or an industry. What doesn't work is this supply side idea that you just fund pure science, that wonderful things will come out of it, because it just doesn't. That's an amazing inversion of the standard view, right? The standard view is that it is government dollars shorn of any industry interests, shorn of the, I guess, distorting effects of incentives that uh, keeps science pure, and then coupled with the mechanism of peer review, and that's how you get pure science out. And that if you do it in industry, you'll have people, you'll have tobacco companies funding cancer studies, and they're going to find what they want to find in order to uh, boost the bottom dollar. And you're saying, no, 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 if you actually look at 500 years of science funding, it's exactly the inverse or pretty close to it. It is pretty close to it, though. Let me admit it, that big food, big tobacco, these, these organizations undoubtedly abuse science. There's absolutely no question about that. And therefore, it is very reasonable for the government to do as a mission, a government mission, to do double checking of the claims made by big industry. That's a perfectly reasonable government mission. But that is not the same as government funding science to stimulate economic growth. But what you just said a couple of minutes ago, this disinterested science yields knowledge that somehow could be used. It just doesn't work. There's no evidence that it's true. But if you're going to, I mean, actually, there are reasons why it wouldn't work like crowding out. But if as a government mission to monitor what the private sector is doing, absolutely, no problems with that at all. But that's not government supporting the private sector, which is what the NSF model is. That's government regulating and crushing it necessary in the private sector. That's the proper role of the government in that context. So let's explore this linear model a little bit more. You said that this idea that you can adopt a supply side view of the funding of science, where if you just push out basic research, you will get amazing technologies that come out of that. That's simply false. So as I alluded to earlier, as far as I know, this goes back to Francis Bacon. This was kind of the position that he articulated. It was uh, challenged by Adam Smith, and that forms a big part of the early chapters of the book. So, uh, oh, and by I suppose I should mention that it's uh, the Economic Laws of Scientific Research is, is your magnum opus. It's the one that, you, that you're well known for, so everyone should go pick up a copy. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about those two views and how it was that the, the Smithian one won out? Yeah. Uh uh, well, the, the Smithian one won out in America and Britain for 200 years. The Baconian one won in France and Germany, and there's now one globally. So what happened was that Francis Bacon wrote his book in 1605, the And the point is that Francis Bacon was a politician. He was a lawyer politician, and he was looking for a role. And Queen Elizabeth I didn't like it, never gave him a job. James I came along in England. It may sound odd to be talking about this political events four hundred years ago. And at that point, also, Lord Burley died. And all that may sound very odd. Who cares what happened to England 200 years ago? But the point is this. By then, London was the capital of the English Industrial Revolution. What's often not understood, there's a wonderful book called The Jewel House by Deborah Harkness, the California professor, which explains how beautiful 
16th century science was in England. London at the end of the 1500s was a hotbed of research and development. And fostered by Norberni and by Queen Elizabeth. When those two died, Bacon, looking for a role in life, came up with a theory that if the government funded even more science, in English industrial growth would be even further accelerated. But it was purely self-interested. He wanted a foundation that he could set up and lead at the government's dollar. He failed. He didn't get the money. And England had this industrial revolution without his ideas. What happened was that DBG's France and DBG's Germany in particular thought well, that's a very good idea because they're naturally DBG'd. And so the French and various German monarchs did exactly what Francis Bacon told them to do. And they never caught up even with England, let alone overtook until much, much, much later. But what happened in England, or Britain, I should say at this point, because England becomes Britain in 1707, is that Adam Smith looked at the Baconian case and said, look, it just isn't true. And he went through a series of examples like James Watt at the sea mentioned, but there were other such examples he described, that what was happening on the ground was the technologists were making the discoveries that the scientists in the universities were then scrabbling to this total stat, so for example. James Watt's sea mentioned completely transformed the laws of thermodynamics, which the academics then had to catch up and understand. And Smith said, just empirically, it just doesn't work that way. There's no evidence to supply side push of pure science works. It's only a demand led that eventually gets the academics catching up. And moreover, he had a pretty shrewd idea that Francis Bacon, like the NSF today, by the way, um, or Vannevar Bush, who came up with the whole new idea of the Second World War, was doing it for reasons of bureaucratic aggrandizement. Every rational person in this world wants to risk head up a huge government bureaucracy. There's no better job than heading up a huge government bureaucracy. You get a huge salary, you get a nice big motor car, everyone treats you with great respect, and no one holds you to account as far as we can see. Everyone wants to do that, and everyone lobbies for it. The other thing that we must all remember is that everybody, everybody lobbies for the government of funding of science, which is why it's so rare for the idea to be critiqued. So. Academics obviously lobby for it because they want money on their own terms. Universities lobby for it because they want to build new libraries and things. Politicians lobby for it because they want to go around like Latter day Medici's funding Galileo. Never forget in the year 2000, I've never forgotten the year 2000, Bill Clinton in America, Tony Blair in England stood up and claimed that they had, had sequenced DNA. Oh, there, was some, there was some scientists in the background, but they'd funded it and they took all the glory. So, uh, government ministers love funding science. Industry loves government about science because it thinks wrong well, as it turns out, but it thinks it's getting science for free. That's why that's why industry models for science. And of course the general public model for science, because they love the idea of old glory sly who that's American dollars giving us a great advance. Or they love the idea of looking at lovely photographs of planets and things with these new telescopes and every and then also they think it's a good idea anyway. So it's because no one ever lobbies against the government of funding science that the idea has ever been properly critiqued. So uh, I shall stop there because my answer has become a bit rapidly. But that is my answer to you. Are you enjoying this episode of the Futurati Podcast? If so, please like it, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and share it with your friends. By far, the best way to help us grow is to spread the word on social media, which will expose our content to more people and help us continue to bring you interviews with world-leading experts in AI, quantum computing, cryptocurrencies, and so much more. Thank you in advance. No, that's that's fantastic. I, as you were speaking, it occurred to me that one might critique the demand side of the model by saying that it's an artifact of the primitivist, uh, primitive quality of science in the 19th century. And what I mean by that is it's hard for me to imagine anything that I or a team of people could be doing in my garage that would motivate foundational changes in the standard mo model of particle physics or views on cosmology, things like that. It's, it, it's all well and good for thermodynamics to have been driven by James Watt's invention of the steam engine, because that's something he could do in a, in a workshop. Do you think any of that low hanging fruit has been picked and now it's just much harder for fundamental science to be driven by missions like that or driven by the demand side than it once was? Look, um, there are two answers to that. First of all, never forget that 7% of 
of all industrial R&D goes to basic science, 7%. And when you consider the huge size of industrial R&D, that means the amount of industrial funding for basic science is absolutely near matching that of the NSF and the NIH. So uh, you, can't, you, can't be a, you can't be a successful company without doing basic science. Companies that neglect basic science don't have basic scientists, and those people have the expertise to bring in ideas from other companies and to participate in their own research. So industry finds basic science very problematic. Uh, but your question is, um, would we have things like particle physics uh, without pure science? Well, don't forget, um, uh, well, let's go into the history of astronomy. Where did the great advances come from before the government moved in after 1940? Well, who discovered um, that the, uh, the nebulae were spiral? Who discovered that galaxies were spiral? It was the third Earl of Ross in the 1840s. So it was a very rich man who lived in Ireland. Who actually discovered radio astronomy? Who first said the stars emit radio waves? It was Penzias working in Jansky working at Bell Labs. Who found the background microwave radiation big bang and all that? Two or more researchers working at Bell Labs. And one who discovered Pluto? It was the Lovell astronomy privately funded in, in California and go on and on and on. And what you find, especially astronomy, is it's so romantic and glamorous that before the government moved in after the Second World War, the private sector was falling over itself to fund it. Now, I would say to you two things about the examples you've come up with. First, there is absolutely no suggestion that the sort of research being performed at the Fermi Lab and all that sort of thing has any possible economic significance. This is purely a luxury good, like the building of pyramids in Egypt or the building of Gothic cathedrals in 14th and 13th century France. Nothing wrong with luxury goods. But when you have real pressure on the public sector, it is reasonable to ask whether we should be spending money on yours and things which have no possible relevance to the American taxpayer when there's so many other possible demands on the American taxpayer. But the other thing I say is this. As people like Bill Gates show, once you produce enough billionaires or even trillionaires, they will spend money on R&D as they did in the 19th century, as they did in the 20th century, if, if the gap is open to them. And I have no doubt, well, very little doubt, that if the government wasn't funding Fermi Lab or the other labs like that, we would be getting these trillionaires funding those as well, instead of sending their rather silly spaceships up into space for no very good purpose. So it sounds like in the absence of government funding, you've got at least two mechanisms by which fundamental science would nevertheless receive the dollars it needs. One is patrons, just billionaires or trillionaires who find the universe fascinating and they now have the resources to dispense uh, towards furthering that knowledge. And then you also have industries which must invest in basic science if they expect to maintain their competitive edge. Great, you understand exactly what I'm saying. I may be wrong, but you at least understand. <laughs> well, that, that's worth something. So can you talk to us a little bit more about how that funding of basic research happens in these companies. So we're all familiar with Bell Labs. I think we're all familiar with uh, Xerox Park. Could you just say a little bit more about what that looks like? Uh, are there unique models to how that unfolds? Uh, is there a story you could tell around that? Well, that's more difficult funding enough. I mean, there are stories you could tell, like DuPont, for example. DuPont, which is a very the invented line of all that, fantastically storied company, great history. And what is interesting about the bond, it goes through phases. It's, it's well over 100 years old now. And sometimes it goes through phases where it clamps down on basic science because it can't see the point. Sometimes it clamps down on open science. It can't see the point of DuPont scientists revealing their information. At other times, DuPont does what, for example, Procter & Gamble did about 10 years ago. It suddenly switches like that and suddenly becomes open to uh, exposing research and bringing back research and starts to find pure scientists. But if you just look empirically, simply empirically, the companies that go through DuPont or Procter & Gamble, they go through phases of funding pure science and being open in disclosure as well as receipt, simply grow faster economically. They end up making greater discoveries. And this was best described by a, a, an economist now sadly dead, Nathan Rosenberg at Stanford. And he simply pointed out that no company can stand alone. Almost every bit of science a company does is actually imported from other companies. And there's nothing wrong in that. But to import science from other companies, you need scientists. 
And if you want to spread the knowledge you're importing from other companies, if you're a Swiss watchmaker, and as a Swiss watchmaker, you suddenly realize watches are no longer clockwork, they're going electronic. If you're not funding the pure scientists in house, you can import that new technology, and pure scientists are the best of all of that, then you'll go bust. And so the empirical evidence is very clear that although people don't always fully understand it, companies have discovered empirically, like a sort of DNA collective memory, that pure science, although it's very hard to understand the advances uh, on a day to day basis, pure science is ultimately one of the major sources of profit for a big company. It just works that way. There's a, a point you made there that I didn't pick. You, you've said it several times that I didn't pick up on it, that you need pure scientists, even if all you're doing is ripping off other people's discoveries. So, so even if all you're doing is taking the latest machine learning papers or AI papers and having somebody implement them, or the latest discoveries in recombinant DNA and having somebody reverse engineer that, you still need a staff of pretty top-notch basic scientists even if you never innovate anything on your own, even if all you do is is scour the web for the papers and try to do it yourself, you still need a staff of really well-educated people who are skilled in doing that kind of research. And so that is there the, should always be a market. Is, yeah, there should always be a market for that kind of thing. That is absolutely the whole point. Um, Genentech is the classic result. When Genentech was created, you know, created did the insulin and all that, fantastic work. Genentech was created under this extraordinary philosophy at the time of the seed of extraordinary, that it would be just like a university lab, completely published, completely open. And the purpose of that is that it's not the basic science that the company funds. That's a value. The company is funding the basic science only because if it doesn't fund the basic science, the basic scientists will go away. So you fund the basic science as a form of payment to the basic scientists. But what you're really funding the basic scientists for is to import knowledge. And don't forget, companies live largely on knowledge they import from other companies. It's an unusual process. If you have 10 companies in the world all competing for a particular technology, and that's not a reasonable expectation, nine out of 10 of the discoveries that are relevant to any particular company will be made by one of the other nine companies. What is often forgotten is that companies collaborate on research. It's sort of under the radar. People don't really understand it, but antitrust law doesn't stop that sort of thing happening because it's recognized at the legislative level. Something like 20 to 25% of all company advances are actually disclosed, to, disclosed, actively disclosed to companies by their competitors. So what happens is that most advances are done by company A, keep an eye on company B and C what it can steal, but company A and company B also come together and literally and openly share knowledge across the table. This is sort of common throughout industry. I've talked about it in a new book I'm about to write, i rather nearly finish. And this is an aspect of the ecology of industry that's amazingly underrecognized. MIT Sloan is about the early institution, has really studied this process at some depth. It's a most extraordinary thing. Um, uh, but, but industry shares knowledge, and it does it because there's nothing to lose. So um, the way you progress in science and technology is by the rearrangement of knowledge. So if 10 people come together all and each give each other 10 pieces of knowledge, then the new numbers of combinations are thousands and thousands. So if I give you knowledge and my number of people put knowledge into a common pool, we now have access to 10 pieces of knowledge put them in different reorganizations. We now actually have access to a hundred or a thousand different possible technological consequences. And so we all benefit from giving each other knowledge. But Mr. Number 11, who doesn't take part in this process, they are restricted to only one piece of knowledge and they will certainly lose out. And so the sharing of knowledge, even in industry, is extremely benign. I was put in mind of some of the stories you, you hear about Soviet and American scientists talking to each other during the Cold War. Like even when you had this frost that had settled over the world and there were uh, very few lines of communication and a sort of a, a universal hatred of both sides for each other, you still had the physicists sort of covertly talking to one another and possibly probably not sharing information exactly, but it's, it's pretty hard to, to stop people doing this kind of basic research from talking to their peers, at least on some level. There's just this natural need, in, and even if they don't understand it in explicit terms, an implicit understanding that there's a lot of value in that exchange of information. 
Absolutely, and they, they were exchanging information quite openly. And if it's happening between America and Russia, just think of how much it happens to be Unilever, Procter & Gamble. These companies are engaged in the sin city of itself in my field of biochemistry. It's a collective. And so, for example, there was the recent thing, these wonderful breakthroughs in Alzheimer's. What was happening until very, very recently is that all the Alzheimer's companies were coming together with the Alzheimer's charities. There's a very nice story about this in Financial Times about three years ago. And all say, quite openly, we benefit from sharing knowledge because we're at the level of science at the moment where nobody knows the way forward with Alzheimer's research. We now know it's all monoclonal uh, mono antibody stuff, but we didn't know it until relatively recently. And so we all benefit from sharing knowledge. And if company A makes an advance, it's actually in my, in my interest that they should do so because they've opened up a door that I also can exploit. The most important words in all economic history, Trent, the most important words in all economic history is that every researcher in industry has a vested interest in the success of every other researcher. The better that other researchers do, the more research I can exploit and the further, the faster the field moves that I can also benefit from. And this is completely misunderstood by the, what they're called endogenous growth theorists. It's completely understood by almost all economists and science. So let me give you a story. If you look at all the standard economics reviews of science funding, right up to literally the current day, it goes all the way back to Nelson and Arrow. Yes, let me just tell you a story because it's very interesting. So Sputnik is launched in 1957. The American government from 1958 launches NASA, it launches uh, ARPA, it launches a huge expansion of science at every level. And this creates a real ideological problem in America because America is like copy communism. And that was not an era when you wanted to be seen to be copy communism. And so the RAND Corporation took, put up its hands, RAND means research and development, which was created by the army after the war to lobby for the government fund for science and never pretended otherwise. Paid two very distinguished economists, Ken Aaron, who actually won a Nobel Prize, and Richard Nelson, who became the Doyen economics of science in America. They both published papers under the RAND banner. There was no pretense. And these two economists engaged in a fiction. I don't want to get into the details of economics because it's actually quite abstruse. But the world of economics is very different from the world that you and I inhabit. You and I inhabit a world where companies seek monopoly profits by the research they do. But there's this other world that economists inhabit, which is the world of perfectly competitive markets. It's a very nice mathematical model. It has certain value. But in a perfectly competitive market, there are no profits. There's no research. Ridiculous as a model of the actual economy. It, but, but what Richard Nelson and Ken Arrow did is they said, look, if they're perfect, we all want perfectly competitive markets, which we don't, of course. But they said, we, let's pretend we all want perfectly competitive markets. Well, perfectly competitive markets can't support R&D. Therefore, the best market of all can't support R&D. Therefore, governments have to fund it. And it was a nonsense right from the beginning. What you get now amongst economists is the classic econometric mistake. The classic mistake in econometrics and the statistics is to mistake a proxy measure for the real measure. And this is a real scandal, by the way. So if you look at nutrition research, for nearly 40 years, the nutritionists used blood levels of cholesterol as a proxy for what they were really interested in, which is death rates. Uh, but the reason they didn't look at death rates is there's no evidence whatsoever that the cholesterol story had anything to do with death rates. So they stuck with the proxy story because that, of course, was something you couldn't monitor. So you publish a paper and look at cholesterol levels and say, look. But in fact, what they were not doing is looking at death rates. Well, it's exactly the same with the economists. What the economists do is this. They say, look, if company A funds a piece of science, companies B, C, D, and E get more benefit from that science than does company A. And that's true. That's absolutely true. If I found a piece of science and there are 10 Trent Fowlers out there, you 10 Kent Trent Fowlers will make greater profit out of my research than I do. That is a proxy measure. You're looking at what Trent Fowlers. But that's not the point. The point is that all those Trent Fowlers, which the economists don't see, have themselves invested in research because otherwise they would be able to import my science. 
And they don't see that in their qualifications. And what they also don't see in their qualifications is that the real benefit of my funding science that you all stealing is that I'm now qualified to steal your science. And so the economists, even to this day, have a proxy measure of what they call spillover. If I fund science, you get benefit more than I do. And they don't see the cost to you and the benefit to you of your science. And so they continue to perpetuate the myth that governments have to fund science by really inadequate econometrics. It's actually a scam. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on that because you mentioned earlier that the replication crisis is actually worse than is commonly appreciated. And I, I feel like I have a pretty good appreciation for how bad it is. So I mean, what what is going wrong in, in science now uh, between this spurious model that you referenced, the perfect competition model, which, you know, as I mentioned, is a ridiculous, uh, it's a ridiculous ideal to strive towards. It doesn't describe how economies actually function. It's a mathematical abstraction, which has certain useful properties for studying, but in no way, shape, or form is it something you should be working towards. And we now know that we have this replication crisis. I mean, is it all driven by the government crowding out the private sector and not not subjecting scientific research to market discipline? Are there other factors at play? Because it seems like there's something very wrong. Something has gone wrong in the, in our endeavor to understand the universe. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is just that the government has created this very strange ecosystem. I and mean, if you read, if you look at what researchers at the NIA, or rather administrators, the NIH and the NSF were saying after the war. Universities in those days were teaching institutions and centers of scholarship. They didn't do research. And the NIH and the NSF, it's funny to think about it now, but in the 50s, they had to persuade and beg and help the universities to do this thing called research. And many universities resisted it because they actually thought it was dilution of their real mission. But of course, by the 60s, it had become the measure of how you judge your research how many grants they got and how many papers they published. Now, that's a proxy measure, by the way. No one was asking, is the American taxpayer getting benefit from this? Benefit being measured by GDP per capita increases or health benefits. And what's extraordinary is you don't see any of the long-term trends to health benefits or GDP per capita. They don't shift at all in these long-term trends. So you use proxy measures. How many grants does this person get? How many papers does this person publish? The awful thing about the replication crisis is it's not subject, not so much to market testing, although you're absolutely right, but specifically to use Daniel Sarabis' expression, to technological testing. So if you're a food company, say, or you're a government, say, and you want to be told that I want to make people better, if you then say to the scientists that you're employing, I want to see improvements in health, in actual mobility and more statistics, then those scientists are held to that measure. But if you go to the NSF and say, fund as you wish, we leave it to peer review, then they'll forget about the really difficult measure, and they'll go to something like blood levels and cholesterol, which is very convenient, because now they'll hold them for a pound. And then you get a whole ecosystem of thousands upon thousands of scientists who know that unless they publish papers that say that, trans, uh, that saturated fat raises cholesterol, brackets, which therefore kills you, close brackets, then they'll prove that. Okay. No one ever has proved it. It's not true in that sense, that naive sense. Then you end up with a story that you have an entire ecosystem of men and women pursuing very successful and lucrative careers purely in a self-interested fashion without being held to a cack. And so, of course, it's a very nice life for them. And they probably believe they're doing good work. But it has become wholly self-indulgent and there's nothing to do with reality. Do you need a dynamic and knowledgeable speaker for an event? Thomas Fry and me, Trent Fowler, are both seasoned keynote speakers, able to converse on a wide array of topics to audiences of all sizes and skill levels. Go to the contact page at futuratipodcast.com to book Thomas or myself today and let us apply our years of experience in public speaking to make your event a smashing success. It occurs to me that they're facing something of a difficult problem there because you often have to rely on proxy measures over the long term because the phenomena you're studying are incredibly complex. Some, something like human health, it's often a thing you can recognize when you see it, but if you're actually going to make progress in the research, you have to come up with these proxy measures along the way, maybe maybe if you're disciplined enough, you don't lose sight of the fact that they are proxies and that they're not the real thing. But do you think that in, in the private provisioning of science, that market discipline just helps them keep their eye on the ball better and that they're less... 
they're less likely yeah. to get mixed up in in the in the metrics that aren't actually capturing the phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, how do we know that blood pressure is bad for you? We forget now, but a hundred years ago, doctors assumed that blood pressure was probably quite good for you because it pushed the blood through. But it was the actuaries in the life insurance companies who realized there was this correlation between high blood pressure and premature death. We forget just how much the private sector has an investment in all these parameters. And uh, smoking uh, causes cancer. And we know that's a government discovery. It's a very unpleasant discovery, actually. Um, you know, it was discovered by Adolf Hitler, sadly. Adolf Hitler had a prejudice against uh, smoking, and he set his scientists to find it. And then they found it was true. But the actuaries were actually on the point of making that discovery anyway, because they were also making it. Because, of course, after the First World War, there's this huge increase in smoking. And by then, it was beginning to filter through to the actuaries at exactly the same time. The hidden scientists are making the same discovery. So the private sector has all sorts of interests, the health and longevity of people. And uh, one of the things they would have known with, as the cholesterol story emerged is they would have been much more focused on correlating those cholesterol levels with life expectancy rather than as the government-funded scientists did, is using proxy measures as their sole measure. And so the actuarial profession and the life insurance companies would have had a best interest in holding the scientists' technological and commercial and longevity account in a way the NSF and the NIH never did. What, what do you make of the rise of states like China, which seem to be making major technological and scientific advances, operating on what from the outside looks like a wholly different model, a very top-down and authoritarian model where scientists have to toe something of a party line. I, I take it that they're given more freedom than Soviet scientists were. Uh, so you don't have the equivalent of Lysenkoism in China, as far as I know. But And, and, and of course, we know there's this wrinkle where and they steal IP from the West and uh, steal scientific advances from the West. But nevertheless, it does seem as though they're making advances in things like quantum computing and artificial general intelligence and similar sorts of things operating on a model that's very different from the one that you've elucidated so far. Do you think that, I mean, is there anything to that? Is this just a fabrication of the statistics or, or is there something there worth exploring? Oh, well, what the China, I'm for start, we must not forget that China is a much poorer country than America or mm -hmm. Europe. GDP per capita in China is still surprisingly low. Um, but the China's model, there's nothing original about it. This is exactly what France and Germany did in the 18th and 19th centuries when they were catching up with England, which was that was the lead. And so uh, there was actually a reasonable re belief on the part of the French and German states governments. There were many German states, there was one French government, to say, if we create universities and train people in universities scientifically, we can help fertilize industry. The British never had to do that. The British never funded science. Now, the whole Industrial Revolution took place without the government funding science completely, even more than in America, there was no government funding science. The science came out of industry, the needs of industry. Now, France and Germany believed they could shortcut that process by the government putting money into universities and training up the scientific body. They never caught up, actually, with Britain that way. I mean, it's extraordinary convergence. It only happened in the 1960s and 70s, but it's a very different world. But that was the thinking behind it. So the France and Germany just didn't grow. One of the great myths, which I expose in my new book very carefully, one of the great myths that France and Germany were economic miracles before 1914. Oh, no, they weren't. The gap between 1914, between British and French and German states, and 1814 was just as big. Britain always remained, completely less if that, always remained the same gap above France and Germany. But of course, they grew as Britain grew because they were copying as much as they could. And don't forget also, by the way, America copied. Um, there was a man called Slater, to the British called Traitor Slater, because under people like Alexander Hamilton, you paid bounties uh, to British technologists to come across to America secretly and copy British mills and steam engines and things. And people like Charles Dickens, even in the 1850s and 60s, was complaining that America didn't have copyright law so they could riff off his books, but you were completely riffing off all our technologies. Intelligent companies sorry, intelligent countries that are catching up should copy because that's how they get richer. It's a perfectly sensible thing. So to come back to China, China is investing in lots of prestige projects that are a drag on their economy. Um, I mean, why is Pakistan got nuclear weapons and moon rockets? Why is India got 
atomic weapons and moon rockets? Why is China got atomic weapons and moon rockets? This has nothing to do with economic growth. If the moon rockets, or rather the satellites with commercial value, those countries are now rich enough to be able to afford those themselves. So a lot of this is just status. And that's what com companies do. That's what countries do. Countries do seek status. But in as much as China is copying America and accelerating economy, yes, of course, will good things come out of it? Yes, of course, good things came out of France and Germany, scientifically, even though they were so much poorer than Britain. Because after all, you do a lot of science, something's going to come out. The real test in, in China will be uh, what happens to GDP per capita? Because that's all that matters at the end of all that day. What will the living status of the average Chinese person be? And there's no evidence, just isn't, that the huge government funding by China of all this R&D academic science is going to bear any economic fruit. And by the way, it is in fact a surprisingly uh, capitalist model in, within that funny little uh, bubble they have in those Chinese universities. Scientists get paid for publishing prestigious journals, which of course drags down the level of the quality because they have an incentive for publishing. That's a really a false incentive. But scientists actually have quite a lot of freedom with the Chinese universities to publish and to pursue what interests they want because China is trying to raise its profile as a great science country. They're wasting their money, they're wasting their time, just as Russia did. Uh, for the final question, I wanted to ask you a little bit about funding mechanisms. So obviously you have uh, patronage. You just have wealthy individuals who fund these projects. You've got companies doing similar sorts of things. Uh, and then you have bounties and prizes. Uh, now that we have blockchain technologies, crypto economics, uh, nothing fundamentally different, but maybe new mechanisms, new rails you could put into these projects. I wonder if you've given any thought to uh, alternative funding mechanisms that might be on the horizon, enabled by new technologies or new social norms, which could push fundamental science forward in ways that are unique compared to historical avenues for advancing those uh, those endeavors? Well, um, the question is, do we need to do any of those things? I mean, the market will fund the of basic science anyway. And of course, the model of the 19th century England, which is a very interesting model, was that it was rich people themselves doing science. So I mean, Darwin was a, personally a rich man. The Earl of Ross was personally a rich man many such examples. Although, of course, they also supported poor people like Huxley or Bonis and all the rest of it. Um, so then there were prizes. The Royal Society of Arts, which is, is a very nice book by Anton Powers on the Royal Society of Arts, created in the middle of the 18th century in England. And it existed for the purposes of giving prizes to people to stimulate R&D. Uh, Don Harrison, who discovered um, how to measure longitude, he was working towards a prize that the British government's Board of Longitude had set up. And uh, uh, benefactors coming to, I mean, George Stevenson first came up with the idea in, in, in northeast of England, came up with the idea of the miners' lab. He got a prize of a thousand pounds, which in those days was a fortune from local miners. So prizes for technological and scientific discovery, of course, have been quite established. Crowd, crowdfunding as such didn't exist you know, because they didn't have the internet. But if you look at the way George Stevenson's thousand pounds was collected, Literally, lots and lots and lots of mine owners all get together. So all these are actually recreations of old models, and they're driven by a perfectly noble desire to push back the frontiers of knowledge for its own sake. I have nothing against that. Uh, and if people want to fund it, fine. But uh, more than fine. But let no one think that they are promoting economic growth, because economic growth is driven by hard scrabble thinking. People in the industry will fund science if it's in their benefit, and if it's not, they won't. So what you're looking at is a cultural phenomenon of economic value no more than supporting the National Arts, the National Gallery in Washington, the Metropolitan Opera in New York. Those are very fine things, but they're not going to stimulate economic growth. And that's essentially what science as a cultural activity is about. And all the different things that you've described actually are much, much older than people realize. I have nothing against any of that, but we don't need any of that. Never forget that the definition of pure science, the definition of pure science is science that's being funded that the market wouldn't otherwise fund. And I am not a market fundamentalist. We've seen two market make too many mistakes in 2008, for example, 1929. So I'm not a market fundamentalist. But when it comes to R&D, the history is very clear. The market consistently gets it right 
and other sources of funding, whether it's the French and German governments or whatever, simply are irrelevant to economic growth. Although, having said all that, people want to fund pure science, that's great, but it's a cultural activity, it's not an economic activity. Well, that's fantastic. I, I think we've taken enough of your time. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave the audience with before we, we wrap up here? No, you've been a very good host. And let me explore my thoughts the way I wanted to. So thank you very much. Of course. And where can people go to find out more about your uh, your work? I hear you've got a new book coming. You want to tell us some information about that? Yeah, my new book is, uh, uh, this is the first time I've ever written a book without an agent and without a publisher because I didn't want to feel pressurized. And so it's going to be my last book. And it's going to be called, I hope, by, it's going to be called Economic Revolution. And I think it's an exciting book because I address what the economists have been saying. It's quite hard for a lot of economists to understand what economists say. But what you do understand is it's surprisingly, well, it's not profound, actually. I mean, it, it, it's, it's coming up with ideas that you could build mathematical models on. But once you get to the core of the ideas, like the perfectly competitive market, it, it leaves you rather astonished that people get away with that sort of simplistic thinking. So uh, it's no one listens to any social scientist apart from to the economists. So, for example, the sociologists have done amazing work for over 50 years on what goes on in science. Um, you know, people like Robert Merton, long dead now, really describe what went on in laboratories and how it really works. But no one listens to sociologists. Governments listen only to economists. So if we are to reform the government funding of science, and we should, you have to use the economists' own language against them. And so I call this book Economic Revolution, because I actually want a revolution in economics, but I also want to explain how the industrial revolution in today's research actually works, and it's a sort of double thing. And what it basically says is this is where the economists have got wrong, this is actually how science is funded, and this is how economic growth happens. So it's quite an ambitious book because I'm bringing together two disparate fields, the study of science as a sociological phenomenon and the study of economic growth as an economics phenomenon and bringing the two together. My goodness me, it's fun. Well, we'll have to have you back on when that's done. I await it with, uh, with great interest as I uh, read your, your original book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. So thank you so much for walking me through all of this. I really appreciate it. And it's been a, a real pleasure. It's been lovely, Trent. Thank you very much.